Army suddenly went on strike and said some other method must be found of settling the dispute, end of quote. It was a similar question that I was posed to me as a young boy growing up in Connecticut. I profited from the Sunday night dinner session at which my father discussed with us the major issues of the day. One of these discussions in the mid-1930s dealt with the question of how do you stop wars? Father raised the question and then asked us if we had any thoughts on the answer. A long silence ensued, which was unusual because we were a voluble family. Finally, Father supplied his own answer, which ran as follows, quote, the people don't want wars, it's their leaders who start them. To stop wars, you have to punish the leaders. I thought about that question both then and afterwards. I had heard a great deal from Father and others about the horror of World War I. I hoped, as the posters put it, that, quote, they, the heroes of World War I, shall not have died in vain. Still, Father's question was intriguing, and I wondered whether his answer was the right one. I knew that other approaches had not worked. The question was one that stayed with me and ironically enough became one of the ruling passions of my life. So much that in the early in 1946, I had become one of the prosecutors at Nuremberg. As you all are undoubtedly aware, the interim had seen the coming and going about Adolf Hitler. Hitler had convinced the German people that their destiny and security lay with its expanded international and domestic German sovereignty. Lebensraum, or living space, was the order of the day in Hitler's Germany as he led the country into World War II with the attack on Poland and subsequent aggressions culminating the attack on Russia. Hitler's invasion of Russia reached its zenith in December 1941 at the outskirts of Moscow where his armies were stalemated. Thereafter, and particularly following the German surrender at Stalingrad in February 1943, it was pretty much all downhill for Hitler's legions, culminating in the near obliteration of Germany by the Allies. In the ruins of shattered Germany, the German people realized that their security was not to be identified with expanding sovereignty and domination. After the surrender of the German armies, the question then fa be faced by the Allies was what to do with the German leaders who had participated with Hitler in his attempts to expand German control and sovereignty over the entire European continent. Most of Europe lay devastated because of Hitler's aggression. This destruction had been carried out in the name of the German state. Some of the acts were condoned by German law, but some of the acts uh, were condoned by German law, but were clearly contrary to international law. Could that higher law be used to bring the Nazi leaders to justice? Moreover, could that higher law be expanded in order to deter such conduct in the future, particularly where the advances in technology ensured that another conflict could threaten the very existence of civilization? Albert Einstein once said, quote, the significant problems that we face cannot be solved on the same level of thinking that elevated them, end of quote. For mankind to break the age-old saga of war, it was time for innovative modes of thinking. Nuremberg, and more significantly, Robert Jackson, presented a revolutionary approach, not only for justly punishing the Nazi leaders, but also, prevent such, also to prevent such destruction in the future. The approach, this approach, targeted the concept of sovereignty. Nuremberg established that international peace and prosperity is possible only when there exists a system of limited sovereigns. Specifically, the sovereigns must be limited in their interactions with other sovereign states. Moreover, the sovereign must be limited from committing terrible crimes against citizens of different states, 
and against its own citizenry. To understand how Nuremberg created a system of limited sovereigns, one must understand the state of the world in the pre-Nuremberg eras. For all of history, humanity had succumbed to the will and whims of the sovereign, whether cloaked in the title of emperor, king, queen, czar, or nobleman. Individual leaders directed their citizenry, and all too frequently their slaves and serfs, to wage aggression on neighboring peoples. For many centuries, countless generations believed their sovereign to be the incarnation of the divine. Therefore, strict obedience was required under pain of death, and the sovereign could not be held accountable for treachery. Over time, the concept of the divine sovereign evolved into a more secular leader. For instance, Hobbes explained loyalty to the sovereign not in religious terms, but in terms of the laws of nature. According to his Leviathan, man gave loyalty to one sovereign out of a need for protection from evil and dangerous men. Locke and later, Enli Locke and later Enlightenment thinkers turned Hobbes on his head, opening that, uh, opining that the sovereign was not supreme solely as a result of nature. Rather, free men had entered into a social contract with the sovereign, thereby giving, the rescind giving rescindable loyalty to the sovereign. These enlightened views led to the concept of limited government, represented in the documents created in the United States of America, the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, as well as revolutionary movements throughout France and the whole of Europe. Nevertheless, while the world began to recognize the rights of free men against their governments, affairs between sovereign states continued in the perennial game of wars and aggression. The Peace of Westphalia of 1648 ended the wars of religion between Protestant and Catholic states and gave rise to a recognized era of nation-state dominance. The world of the post-Westphalia era was a world in which nation-states ruled supreme. It was a world filled with armed conflicts between national sovereigns that brought about death and destruction. It was a world in which international law, such as it was, imposed no effective restraints on nation states and their leaders in starting and carrying out aggressive wars. It was a world in which there were no restraints on national leaders and doing as they please in their dealings with other states. It was a world in which individuals had no standing under international law to charge nation states with violation of their rights as human beings. It was a world in which individuals had no effective obligations under international law as heads or leaders of nation states. Individuals in the pre-Nuremberg world had no obligation to conduct themselves in such a way as not to injure citizens of other nations. In short, it was a world in which international anarchy was the order of the day. Toward the end of the 19th century, world leaders recognized the confluence between increased technology and the primal urge to create war. Consequently, they met and enacted several conventions, such as the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907, which governed the tactics used in war. Nevertheless, little was done to prevent war, and Bismarck's prophecy that, quote, if war breaks out in Europe, it will probably be over some damn thing in the Balkans, end of quote, came to pass. The result was the war to end all wars and the technological horrors of that war. However, the tremendous victories make bad pieces, and notwithstanding Wilson's ill-fated League of Nations, the rise of fascism spread through the European continent following World War I. With the rise of Hitler died the hopes for, quote, a new world order. Nuremberg sought a break, sought a break from this game of war, more destructive war, and the inevitable destruction of civilization. The manner to achieve this goal was that pre-prophesied by my father, i.e., to punish the leaders who started wars. 
It was, however, Robert Jackson who put the concept of limited sovereignty into action. To appreciate the importance of Jackson's mission, I think an excerpt from his first progress report of June 6, 1945 to President Truman is pertinent. In this progress report, he wrote, quote, we are put under heavy responsibility to see that our behavior during this unsettled period will direct the world's thought toward a firmer enforcement of the laws of international conduct so as to make wars less attractive to those have, who have governments and the destinies of peoples in their power." End of quote. Jackson plan, which was agreed to after very tough negotiations with the UK, France, and USSR, was to identify three types of crimes for which the Nazis would be tried. These crimes were, one, crimes against peace, i.e. the planning, preparation, initiation, and waging of wars of aggression. Two, war crimes, crimes in violation of the laws or customs of war, and three, crimes against humanity. For example, murder and ill treatment of civilians for racial, religious, or political reasons in connection with any other crime within the tribunal's jurisdiction whether or not in violation of the domestic law of the country were perpetrated. A fourth crime was added, namely participation in a common plan or conspiracy to commit any of the first three crimes. The crimes were set forth in the so-called London Charter of August 8, 1945, which also provided the fact that the actions were carried out as heads of responsible officials with heads of state or responsible officials was no defense, nor was there to be recognized the defense of superior orders of a government or of a superior. It should be noted that the German armies surrendered unconditionally to their lives on May 8, 1945. There was no sovereign, sovereign German government with which to deal in the surrender arrangements, and since the surrender was unconditional, the Allies could set its terms and all the rules under which they would govern Germany at uh, will. This meant that they were able to dictate the terms under which the Nazi leaders would be tried, including the provision that the official positions of defendants as head of state or holders of high government office were not to free them from responsibility or to mitigate their punishment, nor was the defense of superior orders uh, from an official or superior, such as Adolf Hitler, to be recognized, although under certain circumstances it might be considered a mitigation of punishment. This meant that the defendants could not hide between the, behind the cloak of German sovereignty in justifying their crimes. A word about Nuremberg, the Nuremberg Court. The International Military Tribunal was not a military court martial, and it was certainly no ordinary court was a high-level tribunal with jurists of great distinction. It covered crimes that were massive and had no particular location. The International Military Tribunal was, among other things, concerned with the international laws of war and not the laws of any particular nation. Violation of these laws are war crimes. The International Military Tribunal's activity replaced individual trials in individual countries which would have been very fragmented. Indeed, it was a remarkable collective effort by the nations involved. Just as Robert Jackson's opening statement for the United States of America on November 21, 1945, gives us a sense of the importance of what was transpiring at Nuremberg when he said, quote, the privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant, and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. That four great nations, flushed with victory and stung with injury, stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captives, enemies, to the judgment of the law is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason." End of quote. 
The primary charge at Nuremberg was preparing, initiating, waging wars of aggression. This dealt with wars in violation of Germany's treaty obligations to other countries. And the Nuremberg court landed hard on those who were the object of this charge. In its holding, the tribunal held implicitly that the exercise of German sovereignty did not support the wanton destruction by Germany of other states through wars of aggression, particularly where Germany's treaty obligations said otherwise. It held that those who schemed to extend German sovereignty beyond the limits of international law were guilty of major international crimes, and these crimes, together with crimes committed in the course of Germany's aggression, warranted the supreme penalty, death by hanging. And all the defendants, Nuremberg defendants, find that they were to be judged not by the law of the sovereign state of Germany, but by a higher law, international law, whose principles were superior to Hitler's Germany, German law. They found that they could not hide between, behind the curtain of German sovereignty in an attempt to excuse their crimes, and that the more enduring principles of international law were to determine their fate. In other words, they found that they would be judged as individuals and that they would be punished as individuals for what they did in violation of international law. The cloak of German sovereignty could not protect them from this uh, responsibility. In sum, while the Nuremberg Law did not outlaw the right of sovereign nations to declare and carry out defensive wars, it did hold illegal and condemn aggressive wars, and it held that the Nazis' wars of aggression were beyond the bounds of international law. Nuremberg further held that those Nazi officials who during World War II carried out Hitler's orders calling for violation of the laws and customs of war were guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity. It further found that conformance with the municipal law of Nazi Germany was no justification for their action. So the core of the holding at Nuremberg was that the sovereign rights of a nation state, such as Germany, no longer included the initiation, planning, and waging of wars of aggression. In addition, the Nuremberg Holdings states that the responsible officials of the state that did so were punishable under international law. Nuremberg further held that local municipal law of the sovereign state of Germany provided no cover for individuals who, in the course of a war of aggression, violated international rules governing the conduct of warfare. In sum, Nuremberg held that where Hitler's orders violated international law, those who carried them out were responsible and punishable on international law. Conceptually, this indeed meant a severe but very realistic limitation on the sovereignty of the German state. The first of the four Nuremberg crimes, the crimes against peace, or aggressive war represented a radical departure from the past. It was in this crime that the international crime community finally broke from the Westphalia concept of the supreme state and condemned aggressive war. It must be noted that this was the charge that brought the greatest criticism from the legal community concerning the retroactive application. Simply as we have discussed prior to Nuremberg, Aggression, aggressive war was not a crime. One of Nuremberg's earliest and most vociferous critics, Judge Karl Wysanski, Jr., published an article in the Atlantic Monthly in April 1946 issue condemning ex post facto nature of the crime of against peace charge. Nearly a year later, Judge Wysanski reversed himself, stated that while it may be ex post facto law, the crime of aggressive war was necessary to prevent the perpetual cycle of war that had encumbered international relations for centuries. Similarly, the international community initially balked at holding individuals accountable for the crimes of the state. However, as a matter of sheer logic, if tyrann tyrannical dictators espoused Louis XIV's they taught, say, moi, and deemed themselves the state. Why should these dictators and their agents not be held accountable individually? 
Why should those who control the labors of power in the dictatorship not be responsible for their actions? Nuremberg eradicated the centuries-old concept of an insalable and untouchable sovereign who placed the responsibility of the state on those who control the state. This is the ultimate lesson of Nuremberg, which was passed on to me many years before by my father, that those who act as the state are in turn responsible for the state. The United Nations is the living embodiment of Nuremberg's legacy for the elimination of aggressive war through limited sovereignty. Article 1 of the Charter of the UN provides that the UN's purpose is to, quote, maintain peace and security, and to that end to take effective collective measures for the prevention and removal of threats to peace, and for the suppression of acts of aggression or other breaches of the peace. The Charter thus captures Nuremberg's notion of limited sovereignty. First, it states that nations may to co take collective measures to ensure security. And secondly, it expressly proscribes acts of aggression. Similarly, Article 2 mandates that member states, quote, shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state, end of quote. Nevertheless, as in the Nuremberg Charter, the UN recognized limited sovereignty not the complete destruction of the sovereign state. For example, the Charter does not authorize the UN to, quote, to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state, with perhaps the exception of human rights violations as witnessed in the Yugoslavia and the former Rwanda proceedings. Moreover, Article 51 recognizes, quote, an inherent right to individual and collective self-defense if armed attack occurs against a member, provided that, quote, the right of self-defense shall be immediately reported to the Security Council to, and to take action, uh, take at any time such action as it deems necessary in order to maintain and restore international peace and security. It is this notion of limited sovereignty that Jackson believed would prevent the horrors of the pre-Nuremberg era and to which the international community vociferously, uh, vigorously subscribed in their adoption of the UN Charter. Nevertheless, conflicts have occurred since the creation of the UN, most notably during the Cold War. It must be acknowledged, however, that such acts were not those of naked aggression. They were couched in terms of self-defense, for example, the U.S. justified the Vietnam conflict through the Gulf of Tonkin attack. The USSR invaded Hungary under the guise of the Brezhnev Doctrine. While the concept of self-defense did not ease the suffering of the millions affected by these conflicts, it must be acknowledged that naked aggression has been restrained since Nuremberg and the creation of the U.N. Simply, states must now account to the international community for conflicts created by their, con by their uh, conduct. Fortunately, the end of the Cold War witnessed a renaissance in the Nuremberg spirit. When Iraq invaded the sovereignty of Kuwait in 1990 to 91, the sovereignty of uh, using a Hitlerist claim of reunited Iraq with its ancestral state of Kuwait, the international community engaged in a cooperative effort to expel Saddam Hussein. This communal spirit likewise led to the humanitarian interventions in Yugoslavia and Rwanda. However, the events of recent months caused great concern for the proponents of limited sovereignty. The war of terrorism knows no boundary. The concept of self-defense now extends to threats that are neither imminent nor, in many circumstances, likely. Preemption is now the stated doctrine of the current administration and has already led to one conflict which has had a negative impact on our relations with other nations normally allied with us. History will ultimately judge the impact of recent events. From the perspective of limited sovereignty, it appears that the big kid on the block 
his concern less with restraining itself than when working with, in a collaborative, collaborative effort to rid the world of threats. A return to the pre-Nuremberg era assuredly will make the world once again an unstable, aggressive, and with modern weaponry, self-destructive world. I implore all of you to recommit this nation to the vision of Nuremberg and Justice Jackson. As Nuremberg demonstrated, the only way to achieve peace and prosperity is through a world of limited sovereign. Thank you. So I'll be glad to answer any questions. Uh, yeah. which was a positive result, could President Bush, through the charter of the International Criminal Court, be brought before the International Court for beginning a preemptive war, even though it was not a war of aggression? Uh, the per uh, question is, could Bush be brought uh, before the International Criminal Court uh, for a war of aggression? The answer is no. Aggression is not included uh, actively in the current charter. It has to be defined in the Charter, and the Charter Amendment has to be approved by seven-eighths of the subscribers to the Charter. The answer is no. That's a good question, though. Uh, I think that ba ba what I'm saying here in uh, no uncertain terms is when you uh, – Browning, I think, said beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, what you're talking about is the new U.S. doctrine of preemption, which says that if we see somebody threatening us, we're going to knock them off. Uh, that's a dangerous doctrine. For one thing, we have alienated much of our support in the world by this approach. We may have the military arms, but we don't have the spirit of the world behind us. Uh, I think we have to put the brakes on that. Uh, it's anti-Nuremberg. It's exactly what Jackson didn't uh, want. I think if there's a uh, clear and present danger in an imminent attack, like uh, what Saddam Hussein did in Kuwait, you mobilize the world and you get out there and fight for it. But in the recent uh, episode, uh, there didn't seem to be enough evidence, and there's been not enough evidence certainly to date uncovered to support military action. I think that uh, we have to – people have to speak on this stuff. I think the public in America is law-abiding. We're law-abiding people. We want to live together in peace and security. We don't want to antagonize all our friends in the world. And uh, we've got a lot of people who are supporting this court who were our friends. and. Uh, no longer or not as, uh, as close. And um, we have uh, some uh, performances that uh, are not uh, good for our international relations, uh, like the performance of um, Rumsfeld over in Brussels uh, early in the week. Uh, we just are not in position to say we want our way on everything. If we don't get it, we're going to bump you off. I think that the main thing here is that uh, there's a rule of law in the world and we ought to be party to it. I don't think we should be fighting what Jackson did. I've tried to document what the world was like before Nuremberg and what he did to uh, change the face of the planet. This is a, a world where we uh, need to live together and where the Weapons of destruction are so extreme, whether they're wielded by armies or uh, individual bombers, that uh, we have to learn to relate to one another so that uh, the force is not the ruling factor in the world, that dialogue is. And uh, I think we have a ways to go. I would like to see someone in Congress uh, to speak out on this issue. I think uh, the voices in Congress have been strangely silent. Uh, also, the media 
seems to have been had because the administration took him uh, into their confidence and uh, gave him access to every point that you could put a newspaper man in the war against Iraq. I think we, uh, we have to recognize what we stand for. And I don't think the people of America stand for the doctrine of preemption. I don't. I think that there has to be, uh, this is not what Jackson intended. So this is a personal point of view. And I, I, I really, I think that eventually the, the U.S. public will come around to that view. Yeah. I'd like to hear the clapping. Will you clap? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, that, that, that does me a lot of good because it encourages me. Uh, for one thing, I'm a very patriotic American. I mean, I believe in this country. I think it's a wonderful country. It's just I think we've gone awry. And uh, we have a guiding light in, in Jackson and uh, we don't, we need to follow his wisdom. I think it was, he's a very wise man. And uh, he created a new world. And the Europeans, above all, have recognized that he had the answers. And now we turned our back on him. This is shameful. So it doesn't mean that because you criticize uh, U.S. policy that uh, you're a person who is trying to undermine the U.S. government. I'm trying to preserve it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would. Well, one of the reasons why forums like this are very important and uh, why uh, it's very important that we engage in dialogue is that we're not going to be put in jail in uh, Chautauqua prison uh, <laughs> because of what we say here. Uh, this is the mark of difference between this country and others. This is not true in other countries. And um, so, I think that this is the way you change things. And uh, Jackson had free speech in what he said, and uh, he made changes. Uh, we're a very pragmatic civilization, and we can lead the world as we did under Jackson, because you could change things uh, where you weren't necessarily overturning people by revolution. You were persuading them. Uh, you were talking to them as individuals. This is the important point, as individuals. The individual has been honored in this country uh, for historically more than any other country in the world. However, one thing we have to watch uh, under the current Attorney General is the suppression of uh, civil liberties. So, uh, we have to be on our guard. Being a good citizen in a country like this is being an active participant. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, the, the forces of evil are going to win. And what we have to do is get out and vote. You see a candidate who's for rule of law, who believes in some of the things that were expressed that you believe in, you get out and support them. You can't let the bosses uh, decide everything. And I think that uh, it's both Republicans and Democrats. As I say, I'm sure there are many Republicans here. I happen to be a Democrat, but uh, it's, it's across the board. And there are both Republicans and Democrats working for this rule of law. But uh, I think that uh, I see terrible dangers in the doctrine of preemption because uh, it's too subjective. In other words, if, uh, say, the U.S. Uh, can trump up some uh, dangers in the world somewhere, 
um, through uh, coercion of uh, people in the government who swear to stuff that maybe is not true. Uh, I think that uh, you've got a, a horse that has uh, no, no rider and no limits. So I, I, I think that we, I think Congress ought to play more of a role here. I think that uh, Congress has a, a lot of good people in it. And um, I think the administration, you have a, a, a person as president who has been a governor of a major state who certainly is unsophisticated on international uh, relations, who I'm not describing a lot of evil to personally, but maybe whose advisors to some extent have pretty uh, severe objectives to objections to the rule of law in the world in practice. So um, this is uh, the type of form that uh, enables us to create a better world. and. Uh, I certainly will do everything I can as long as I'm around. Well, you, uh, what you do is you write to George Vonovich, uh, the U.S. Senator from Ohio, and tell him what he's being done, because he has influence. I think that's the way you do it. You don't write to Ashcroft. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think uh, suspicion is one thing, but I believe in proof, and we haven't found them. I mean, they may be there, but we haven't found them. I think it also, uh, what you should do in a case like this is you should mobilize support in the UN, uh, play it out a bit longer. Get the UN so that the nations of the world are on your side, like we did in the first case. That's the important thing. I don't believe in unilateralism. I think that is self-destructive. I think the important thing is that we get uh, use the UN for what it was intended. It was intended as a uh, peace maintenance, maintenance body, uh, but uh, because somebody uh, uh, thinks there's a danger, I don't think that's enough to go on. Uh, there, I think one of the things we should suspend judgment is whether the objectors to the uh, U.S. action in Iraq, both in the U.N. and the United States, were not right. They may have been right. So uh, that's my point. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. I don't think it's a good precedent, no. Right. Can he do it in the future? Well, he could interpret it that way, and uh, I think it's bad legislative history. I think we should put the brakes on uh, the declaration of war. I think that we should make sure that everybody is uh, supportive. Now, Congress didn't blow the whistle, so uh, the, that's, that's certainly a point in favor of what Bush did. On the other hand, we had a terrible fight in the UN, and we didn't get the final resolution that we wanted in support of the war. We had earlier revolutions, 1441, that we reinterpreted to give us support. But I think that uh, we should work as hard as we can to get others on our side. And I, uh, I hope that we can uh, maintain our relationship with the 
important European powers and reestablish it. Bear in mind this, that it's a multilateral world, and uh, whether we like it, globalization is the order of the day. We're related in many ways, and uh, I don't think that uh, we can uh, live in isolation. So unilateralism is not the way the world should go. I think in the long run we're going to find that out. Okay, let's take the administration's view. Uh, landmines, no. No limitation on landmines. Uh, law of the sea, no push. No, no push for ratification, law of the sea. The sea's resources are declining. It's, they need the law of the sea. Every other major country in the world is party to it. Kyoto Agreement, no. No Kyoto Agreement. Uh, we'll go it alone in Iran. International Criminal Court, no. We don't want that. We don't uh, be subject to the same rules as everybody else. It's a terrible pattern that we're seeing. And I think the people need to speak and rise up against it. That's my feeling. Is there yeah. really any hope if we, are, if we are not accountable because of the muscle and the military strength and everything else that we seem to feel allows us to do whatever the heck we want to do? I mean, what can hold the U.S. accountable? Well, I think the uh, Congress is the one that has to. You have, that's Why does it not have to be international? You talk about the world purpose, criminal court, and all these things. What power? I mean, people lose faith in the United Nations because the United Nations can't do anything about it. Well, it has done a lot. I mean, the United well, Nations has. Heaven, the United Nations it. was the vehicle for uh, counteracting the invasion of North Korea by South Korea. It certainly was the vehicle for dealing with Saddam Hussein in the 1991 conflict. It's been a vehicle for uh, action in Cyprus. It's been a vehicle for action in Afghanistan earlier when the Russians were there. Uh, it can be a very useful vehicle, but we're not using it. We're not, we don't pay for, I mean, the, we've cut down our financial support, but uh, we should use it as, Well, uh, we don't want to give up that sovereignty. That's the whole point. We don't want to have our sovereignty. Sovereignty and how limited sovereignty is the answer. Why cannot we be limited in our sovereignty? Well, I think uh, in the long run, that's what I'm advocating. I think that I, I, you certainly have the right to declare war, but uh, defensive war. I'm not ruling that out. And also conduct your domestic affairs usually as you want. I mean, that was, I don't believe in that. Uh, also. I think that uh, we also have our own laws, which are very different from every. I'm not uh, uh, advocating the destruction of U.S. sovereignty. I'm saying that on this one issue, aggression, uh, we ought to limit our sovereignty by agreeing to do it, uh, to work together with other nations on it, and to build a uh, coalition for peace in the world. That's what I'm saying. So I have a very definite views on sovereignty. I, I, I also say that uh, I was in the Milosevic case uh, in March 10, 19, 2003. I sat there for hour after hour and listening to atrocities. I, Milosevic was a, a head of state who committed some terrible crimes. I think it's symbolic that he's being brought to justice at the present time. The first head of state being brought to justice, and this is Jackson's dream, that you should hold people accountable. And I think Pinochet should have been held accountable. He was be wasn't because uh, he was ill. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm sorry, that may not have answered your question, but it's, it's my view. And thank you for asking it. I think one of the things that perhaps uh, <coughs> the average American doesn't realize is that uh, it, this is not simply a question of law. Uh, the, uh, the economic penetration of the planet by American business, uh, the uh, domination of, of uh, in international world culture by American media uh, it is uh, growing exponentially. Uh, the, it's, 
it's the very being of foreign countries uh, that is being uh, eroded by, by America simply doing its thing. And uh, the, I think the legal uh, ramifications should be seen in, in connection with that. America is a far bigger elephant than I think uh, uh, Americans realize. And what they are deciding is not simply a domestic issue of the United States, it is the fate of the planet. Absolutely. Uh, the main thing is that uh, we penetrate the far corners of the globe. As Kennedy admitted, said in his, uh, his uh, inaugural address, the, the important thing is we do have influence. And I'm maintaining that we should influence that, uh, use that influence for the good rather than the bad. And uh, that uh, we have a role to play. And that as responsible citizens, we have to support people who want to do the things we want done. And uh, I think there's danger in being too powerful. I think that uh, we have many areas in the world where we're hated. Uh, you can be we're too powerful militarily. I'm not saying we shouldn't arm. I'm, I'm saying that uh, we haven't we haven't examined the hearts of people. We haven't reached the hearts of people uh, so that we have popular support uh, throughout the world. And uh, during previous eras, we had a lot of friends in the world, and some of our best friends have gone by the wayside, including two, which you know. Yeah. Don't you think that we don't want to support international judgment because we're afraid it will bring to us, for instance, what we did in El Salvador and Guatemala, and still maintaining the former school of America where the terrorists were trained. And when they came, they to show what America was like, we paid for their families to go to Disney World. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know how many American families today can afford to visit Disney World. Well, I think what you're take, uh, uh, saying is that we have to take inventory oh, as to what we're doing. And let me give you an example of uh, U.S. unilateralism in action. Uh, in the Nagra Nicaragua conflict, allegedly, we mined the harbors of Managua, the capital of Nicaragua. This was a violation of international law. Man Nicaragua appealed. Uh, to the International Court of Justice at The Hague. And uh, we said that it didn't have jurisdiction uh, over the case. Uh, and then we pulled out of the International Court of Justice, so we're not party to it anymore. Uh, at the same time, the case went to trial, and the court found that we had been guilty of a violation of international law in mining the harbors of Nicaragua, of Managua. Uh, this is uh, unilateralism gone wild. In other words, if you are members, if you uh, are party to a court and then you lose the case, then you pick up the marbles and go home. It's childish behavior, but uh, that's the way it is. And I say that we ought to be part of the world. That's what I'm saying. Yes, sir. I, uh, uh, I would like to, um, to say that I, I am in agreement and I appreciate your opinion on, on what Paul has. Um, we should not be too idealistic, so the Europeans um, were very interested in us getting the lots of it because of self-interest. They had a lot of refugees coming from the uh, from, from also on so in Italy and Germany and other these countries, they were pushing us to take action there. And uh, the crimes on the Rossovich are, of course, horrible. But we also know that Saddam Hussein committed crimes against his people. He killed many Kurds mm -hmm. as well as other Iranians. At what point is one worse than the other? Does the number have to do with the international court. If you commit crimes with 100,000, 
you may be prosecuted if the next time from only 50,000, that's all right, we'll forget about you. Is there a number involved in that or what is No, that? it has to be a systematic effort. In other words, it can't be one crime. It's got to be the systematic extermination of the Jewish race. That's what you're talking about. In Milosevic's case, uh, he took, uh, he was uh, injuring and killing people who were party to another state, uh, not part of the same state. In the Iraq case, the Kurds were at least under the jurisdiction of Saddam Hussein. I maintain that Saddam Hussein should have been tried. I submitted testimony before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee saying he should have been tried. Uh, we'd have had no crisis in Iraq if we had tried him. I'm saying also with regard to the Europeans, they learned the successes of sovereignty. The Europe in the uh, 18th, 19th, 20th century was the site of most of the world wars. 1866, Franco-German, 1914, German, France, England. 1939, uh, France and Germany, England. They learned the value of surrendering some sovereignty in exchange for peace and a rule of law. But keep in mind that most of the fights in the world are economic and that uh, Hitler fought World War II because of economic reasons. Lebensraum. The Europeans have learned that if you want a rule of law, you have to give up something. You have to have a stake in it. And so they were more accessible to trying Milosevic because of, and to acceding to the International Criminal Court and of course to participating in the, court, the trial of Milosevic in the trial of Rwanda. So there's, that, that's a very important point. You give up sovereignty, you get security. Okay, yeah. When you speak about the prisoners at Guantanamo Bay in terms of human rights and sovereignty? Well, uh, I haven't, I, I'm upset by it. I haven't followed as closely to speak authoritatively on it. But I do know that they've been, ca uh, they've been kept for over a year down there uh, without any uh, action whatsoever. It's a question of how you treat human beings. Are you, are you going to hold them in captivity without trial? Our tradition here has been to charge people uh, with uh, crimes and so they know what the story is. But uh, the prisoners of Antonio Bay have lacked any larynx whatsoever. It's hard for me, it's been hard for me to get the facts on it. So I'm not, uh, I do know one thing that they've been held indefinitely and that that's not uh, in accordance with uh, standards of customary international law. So, uh, but, uh, uh, Ashcroft is is not particularly a, uh, a purveyor of the rule of international law. Uh, he's gone very aggressive on suppression of civil liberties in the United States in the interest of security. But I, uh, other than to express concern, I, I'm not saying anything definitive on it. Yeah. Do one more question, then I sure. think I want to make sure there's enough time so that you can watch the movie. Yeah, right. Are for, you for lunch. Right. over the fact that the United States does not have a foreign policy? It seems that every administration plays it by ear. We build up Iraq because we were in favor of Iran at the time. Yeah. I think a foreign policy is needed. Well, I think one of the things is that uh, we. Uh, uh, that's a very, that's a big question. I know. <laughs> okay, one of the problems you have is that uh, European leaders are uh, sophisticated on international matters because they relate to one another within the European community. Mm -hmm. uh, we take governors from uh, states that are concerned with oil or peanuts or uh, women and uh, so uh, uh, we tend suddenly try to make experts of them 
on foreign policy. Uh, it's hard. I think that's one of the problems uh, that the United States had. And in the past, it used to be different, where the great minds on international policy were brought in, like uh, Henry L. Stimson, uh, some of the great minds that uh, we've had. Uh, we had more sophisticated people. Uh, maybe it was a bit of uh, aristocracy, uh, big lawyers from New York who were international minded went to Washington. Uh, but we had great foreign policy leaders like Senator Vandenberg of Michigan uh, and uh, others. But uh, we face a very difficult situation because to get elected, and the pattern of getting elected is through a governorship now, uh, you have to uh, have been domestic in your interest. You've got to make sure that uh, the, the people who raise, who uh, drill oil get their share of what they want, whether peanut farmers uh, are, are patronized or whether uh, Clinton's constituents uh, are made happy in Arkansas. So uh, it's, uh, it's different, and that's a problem that we have in the states. And uh, it takes a, a, a governor quite a while to get a chance to acquaint himself or herself with uh, foreign policy. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, Mr. Okay. McLean, Mr. McLean, good, Dan, go ahead. I know you've been trying to get it. Yeah. 